Well, this past Wednesday night, I had the opportunity to uh, speak in Mountain Home. They have a summer series there, just like we have here on Wednesday evenings. And I enjoyed it very much. It's a good congregation. There's a lot of, of good relationship between our two congregations. A lot of them send their greetings but I had something happen that while I was there that's kind of beginning to give me a little bit of a complex. And I'm just going to have to work through it, I guess, because um, right before I got up to speak, there was a, a lady that came up to me and sh- she said, You know what? You look just like Joel Osteen. <laughs> now, that's the second time this year I've had someone tell me that. I'm beginning to get a complex. It happened here in town one time where somebody stopped me, and then it happened in Mountain Home. So I'm going to have to go hang around Houston a little bit and see what happens, I guess. One other thing I did want to mention this morning, just because it's kind of a, a, a good time in my life and one that only comes one time, and that is uh, tomorrow is my 25th wedding anniversary. If you can believe that. So time has gone by in, in a hurry, and uh, it's a special time for Susan and I, and we'll be celebrating that tomorrow, if you can believe, 25 years tomorrow. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. You be sure and give Susan a hug and tell her, hang in there. <laughs> Mark chapter 6. And he came out from there, and he came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him, and such miracles as is performed by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. Now, we use this scripture oftentimes to speak about how it is difficult for a person to have any kind of notoriety among his own hometown people. And how that when Jesus returned to Nazareth where he'd grown up, they took offense at him saying, well, this is Jesus, we know him, he's just a carpenter and he lives here in our town and we know his family. But I wanted to uh, use this opening in order to point out that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Now we sometimes talk about the brothers, the names James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. But Mark also writes here, aren't his sisters here among us? So Jesus had brothers and sisters. We don't know too much about many of his family. We have studied recently what author? James, James the brother of Jesus that we see here. And I also wanted to show you that Judas, or sometimes referred to as Jude, is another brother of Jesus. And we're going to be studying from the book of Jude today. Turn to uh, John chapter 7 next. John chapter 7. Now, as brothers and sisters can sometimes do in a family, in this occasion we're going to read about next, the brothers of Jesus seem to be chastising him a little bit or using some sarcasm just a bit. Now, after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. And the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was at hand, His brothers therefore said to him, now this is his brothers, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may behold your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now that sounds pretty good, until you get to verse 5. For even his brothers... For for not even his brothers were believing in him. 
Then NIV says, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. So whenever we see these words, we can set the first words in their proper uh, idea that it was sarcasm. Oh, you need to go show yourself publicly to everybody. You're such an important person. Go on down there and let everybody see how magnificent you are. For even his brothers were not believing in him. That sounds like maybe the way brothers might be. Turn to Acts chapter 1 now, next. Acts chapter 1. After Jesus has died upon the cross, risen, and ascended to heaven, we find that the band of disciples are gathered together in Acts chapter 1, verse 12. And they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. And all these with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And at this time Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren a gathering of about 120 persons there together and said, and then he goes on and tells him about what they would do to replace Judas. But I wanted you to see here that by this point, Jesus' brothers have now changed from those who were being sarcastic to those who were joined with the disciples as believers. So in the past few weeks, we have studied from the book of James. I thought it would be good today then for us to study from another book written by a brother of Jesus, that is the book of Jude. Just some historical and background information. The author of this small letter identifies himself as Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And most scholars agree that this was Judas, the earthly half-brother of Jesus. Now, like James, we are really amazed at the wonderful attitude that Jude has. Notice how the book opens here, this one chapter letter or book Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now the reason that I'm amazed by this, just like James, Jude does not use his half-brother status in order to gain any kind of influence or, or power or lordship. I don't know I could have been so disciplined. I think if I was the brother of Jesus Christ, I think I'd kind of throw that around a little bit. Uh, I might be tempted to say, now you need to listen to what I say. After all, I grew up in the same house with Jesus. And you need to listen to what I say because that was, makes me pretty important. But instead, Jude calls himself a bond servant. It's pretty impressive. It's quite a statement of humility on his part to now once among the mockers of his brother, go on and show yourself if you're such an important person, who now has come full circle, now is at the place of humility, and now says, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now Jude tells us in his book that he had wanted to write about this common salvation that they all share. But there was a pressing issue that he felt compelled that he had to write about. As if when he sat down to pen his letter, he really wanted to say something else, but he just couldn't because there was something else that was more important that he needed to write about. And it was that they contend earnestly for the faith. Dangerous influences had infiltrated the church and were leading the church astray. There's a very similar message between this message in Jude and the message that Peter gave in the book of 2 Peter. Let's read the book together now, Jude. It's just one chapter, so turn your Bibles there. We'll read the whole chapter, or at least most of it, this morning. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible this morning. 
Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Christ Jesus. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing to you, that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for a judgment in the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same manner, these men also, by dreaming, defile the flesh which reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when disputing with the devil and arguing about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Verse 10. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These men are those who are hidden reefs at your love feasts, when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, Carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up their shame like foam, wandering stars for whom black darkness has been reserved forever. About these, Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all. All the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers finding fault following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly flattering people for the sake of gaining advantage. But you, you ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ that they were saying to you, in the last time there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. And these are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, to eternal life, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God and Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before our time, both now and forever. Amen. And as we read this book of Jude, we really see its similarity to 2 Peter. But the basic idea is evil influences or false teaching had come into the church and many were, were believing it. And so because of that, there was division and, and corruption in, in the church. And so as Jude writes here, he is telling them that they need to rely upon the things of God to help them sort through this and to remain strong. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 and 3, Paul writes, Preach the word, be prepared in season 
and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to say. And certainly that defines our time, doesn't it? If you don't like what someone says at some church somewhere, we'll go to another church somewhere where they say the things are just like the way I want them to say them. And certainly with all the different kinds of churches we have, that there are those who will say just about every kind of thing you want to hear. So it's going to be very careful, uh, we have to be very careful as we go through this lesson to see where Jude points us to find out where to stand strong. So let's put some points to this lesson. First, number one, on standing strong. We can stand strong because we are called, loved, and kept by Jesus. Look at the support that he alludes to here in Jude 1. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. A person who seeks to stand firm in his faith alone will fail. But we can stay strong. We can endure because we have all this aid at our disposal to help us. We are called, we are loved, and we are kept for Jesus Christ. Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. When Susan and I went to Israel, how many years ago has it been now? Maybe four or five years ago? I've shown you this picture before, but there was a a place that we visited near Bethlehem called the Shepherd's Grotto. And our tour guide was telling us that these kinds of sheep pens or sheep folds would have been very common in the first century all throughout Israel. Here is a, the next picture shows our group going into one of these, um, these grottos or these folds. Of course, it didn't, wouldn't have had the rail and all that on it back then, but basically it was just a, a cleft in the rock It went into a a, a pen or a fold inside, a a little cave, you might say. And as the tour guide was telling us, it would make a scripture like this mean so much more. John 10 and verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is saying, the sheep are all in the fold and I'm sleeping at the entrance. I'm the door. I'm the gate for the sheep. No animal is going to come in to attack the sheep without first encountering me because I'm sleeping there at the door. And when we think about the idea of lasting spiritually, of enduring spiritually, of being faithful like we read about those men and women of Hebrews 11 who were faithful even when they died we realize that that is only possible by drawing strength from Jesus Christ who will keep us. Number two, don't kid yourself. Standing strong is a continuous fight. We do not need to let our guard down. When we do, we are in trouble. Jude says, Beloved, I made every effort to write to you about our common salvation, but I felt the necessity to write to you, to appeal to you, that you contend earnestly for the faith. And I want you to understand the energy that's behind these words. The verb tense denotes a continuous action, and literally, rather than contend, we could put in there intense fighting, because that is the level of energy that is involved in this sentence. I wanted to write to you about the common salvation we enjoy. But I had to tell you, we've got to stand strong about something. There's a continuous fight going on here. We must be alert and awake and watchful. If we fall asleep spiritually, we're in trouble. You've got to be aware and alert. Wake up. 
In 1 Peter 2.22, Peter writes, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Ephesians 6 and verse 13, Therefore take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Number three, we must stand strong because there are those who twist doctrine. Who twist doctrine. In Jude verse 4, I have a version comparisons here from the NIV, the New Revised, and also from William Barclay's translation. Who turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. The New Revised says, Who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And William Barclay says, who twist the grace of God into a justification of blatant immorality and who deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Sometimes we are masterful at changing the Word of God to read the way we want it to read. And there is a great warning here that's given by Jude to understand that sometimes... The Word of God is twisted in its delivery to people. Here is a list of those who started strong but fell away that are given by Jude. The Israelites, by the way, this will be our study for tonight. The Israelites, the angels, Sodom and Gomorrah, Cain, Balaam and Korah are all given or offered by Jude as examples of those who didn't make it. So the writer of Hebrews gives us in Hebrews 11 a list of those who were faithful and made it. And Jude kind of takes the opposite approach and says, here are those who started strong but didn't make it. They fell prey to disobedience. They fell away. It is for this reason then that we, God's people, must become more and more acquainted with Scripture. Now listen, I make this point a lot from here. In fact, let's go to... uh, Acts chapter 17 for just a moment. There's no slide for this, but Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Verses 10 and 11. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now notice verse 11. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Now I want you to think about who is delivering the preaching. It's Paul. But there's no mention or even any hint here that Paul is offended that people are checking up on his message. There's no idea here that Paul uh, puts himself forward and says, Now wait a minute, I saw a light from heaven. And I heard a voice uh, of Jesus Christ. I, uh, the words that I'm speaking to you, I'm being carried along by the Holy Spirit. There is no need for you to check up on what I'm saying. There, there's no sense that Paul has that kind of uh, uh, idea that he needs to defend himself in that way or that he's insulted. Instead, these Christians are called noble-minded. They receive the word with eagerness, but every day they're going and they're searching the Scriptures to make sure that the things that are being taught are true. Listen. Listen. Never take the things that I say from this pulpit and believe them without first going through and checking on me and making sure that it follows Scripture. If I say anything that is different than you read in here, believe this. And it should be our attitude towards anything in the religious world. Because if we don't choose the Bible as our standard for believability and truth, then anything can be picked. And my opinion is equal to yours. 
And so you hear a lot of people in religious discussion that say, well, I, I believe this. And, and then this person will say, well, I believe that. And the person will say, well, I believe that. And that's great that we have our own beliefs and we need to be convicted in our beliefs. But really my belief and your belief and his belief and her belief or that church's belief and that church's belief or this church's beliefs mean nothing if they don't stand upon the truths of Scripture. It is the place where we go. to. And could it be possible that this church could be led astray? Well, we better believe that it's possible. It is possible if we get away from the Scriptures. So it is important that we, as we think about our approach to religion and our approach to Christianity, that we judge the church and its faithfulness or our own selves and our faithfulness to God according to what we read in the Bible. Do we have to have something as a standard in God's Word is, is the standard that we use. It's the only truth that we can count on. Number four. Standing strong means being watched. Oh, I want to I use that Second Timothy scripture, Herb. Go ahead to that one, because it's a good one. Paul, in writing to Timothy and describing his upbringing, says, How from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. It is then the scriptures. And you know, almost every book of the Bible refers to the importance of standing upon the Scriptures and being firm in the Scriptures. Now number four, standing strong means being watchful for those who look spiritual but are secretly treacherous. Now in this book, in this church that has been infiltrated by false teachers, Jude says there are those who have secretly come among you and are leading you astray. So in verse 12, these men are hidden reefs. In your love feasts. And they feast with you without fear, carrying for themselves clouds without water. I like this phrase, hidden reefs. Just below the surface. Dangerous, but you don't know they're there until it's too late. You must be watchful. Verse 13, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. So those who look spiritual but are secretly treacherous. By the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for a while. You just have to kind of put up with me, I guess. But I want to put in another encouragement about coming to our Bible classes. Young families, your children need to be in Bible class. It builds a foundation for them uh, to learn those stories from the Bible, to know them at a, at a young age. So that as they grow, that... The foundation is laid and their faith and their knowledge of Scripture can grow. It's important for all of us to make this commitment. Because when we know the Scriptures, then we are protected against error. Number two, understanding strong means being watchful for the fruits of godlessness. I want to show you something. Go to we'll put verse 8 up here. These men also dreaming defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. I think these, this verse shows us three different characteristics of godlessness. First, they are immoral. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18, and 20, Flee sexual immorality, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Secondly, they reject authority. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, everyone must submit himself to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. And number three, they don't control their tongues. Jude 10, they speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. In verse 11, in examples of these fruitless deeds, which, by the way, we'll look at tonight in our lesson, offered as examples are Cain and Balaam and Korah. And we'll look at them tonight. Now let's bring this lesson to a close. Listen carefully. 
Standing strong is a continuous fight. I sometimes wonder if the comfort and the peace that we enjoy in this nation makes us just a bit spiritually lazy. Makes us just a bit too spiritually comfortable. Makes it a little bit too easy for those things that are untruthful. Those doctrines that are false to creep in unnoticed. Standing strong is a continuous fight for us. We see it displayed so often uh, among us where people struggle to remain faithful. And we're all in that boat. But we must make a continual commitment to stand with each other and to fight for spiritual strength. Standing strong is possible because we are called, because we are loved, and because we are kept by Christ. Let's make a commitment that this congregation will always stand upon the Word of God. Search the Scriptures daily. Don't let your only spiritual food be what you hear from this pulpit or even from Bible class, but something that you commit to doing yourself. Because when we are strong in our knowledge of Scriptures... We are strong indeed. Let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you for this writing from the book of Jude. Please, Father, make us aware of those things that might destroy us spiritually. To be wise, to have our eyes opened, to be um, spiritually alert and awake. We really have the desire, Lord, to be faithful to you. That's what's in our hearts, but... It's sometimes very difficult. And there are things that sound so right and and so true that are wrong, but they sound right. So give us the places to go in scriptures, in our heart, in our minds, that we can find out what you really desire and what's really true. Because that is our desire, is to be be authentic and to be sincere and to be true in in our Christian walk. That when people see us, that they'll know that that we are sincere and that we are striving to do our best. Please forgive us of our sins and forgive us of the, of the times that we get off track and that, that we do things that are wrong. Please continually lead us back in this fight against evil that our hearts can be pure before you. We know, Lord, that we are not perfect, but that you make us perfect because of your son Jesus. In, in his name we pray, amen. If you'd like to come this morning and to ask for prayers or to become a child of God, to make a statement and say, I need help in being strong in this fight. Come as we stand and sing.